Well, good morning and welcome to worship with Tri Village Online. Hope you had a good Christmas. I invite you, no matter where you're at, to experience the love and grace of Jesus Christ. He is our living hope. I invite you to sing along at home as we worship together. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. Jesus Christ, my living Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down.
was lost, I walked away. The road was dark, I could not see. My hope was gone, the pain was real. But your mercy
helpless as a baby so if we're feeling lost in our own lives we are not alone he has felt the same things because he lived in flesh and blood we joining us online today. You know, it is rare that we cancel worship services here at Tri-Village, and until this calendar year of 2020, I can count on one hand the number of times we've canceled church on Sunday mornings. All but one of those have been for snow. That other exception was in the summer when there were some severe storms and all the power had been out the night before. You may recall this year, though, we were away from having church here in the building for a period of 12 consecutive Sundays from the middle of March through the end of May. And so for today, our elders thought it best after having a round of six Christmas Eve services, families being together over this weekend for Christmas with the increasing cases of COVID-19 in our area, that it'd be safest for everyone if we met virtually today. Now, next week, we plan on resuming our three worship service schedule at 8.30, 9.50, and 11.10 here at church, and our online worship services will be offered at the 9.50 and the 11.10 a.m. times. But our canceling worship services, where large crowds gathered, was only the beginning of the changes we've seen when this pandemic started. The NBA suspended its season the NCAA canceled March Madness. In New York, Broadway theaters were silent. The nation's art galleries and museums closed. Disney's theme parks shut down. 
universities across the country suspended classes and in local school districts everywhere announced that there would be the option of online learning this fall. Senior living centers and nursing homes were placed on lockdown, no visitors permitted to see residents. Essential functions and services were maintained, but most everything else shut down. Basically, America had closed. And 2020 became a year, instead of offering hope, clarity, and vision, it offered uncertainty, fear, and concern. We started hearing the phrase that the public needed to help the healthcare industry so they could flatten the curve. Now, in biblical times, there were pandemics. The Bible often calls them pestilences or plagues. Pestilence is mentioned more than 50 times in the Bible. The biblical writers and their contemporaries did not know about germs that caused diseases. They could not see the microscopic genetic machines we call viruses and how they hijack healthy cells and use them to replicate their unhealthy genetic codes. When these pestilences occurred in the biblical times and the outbreaks occurred, the only conclusion was that the rapid spread of the illness which killed thousands of people must have been the work of God. Now, there are some today who believe the pandemic we are now in is the will of God and He brought it upon us to punish us or teach us or to bring out the good in us. But I don't necessarily believe that. If I did believe this pandemic was from God, I would not advocate any type of safety measures and protocols because that means we're fighting with Him and we're going to lose no matter what we do. I don't believe God sent the coronavirus, but I do believe that He is with us in the midst of this pandemic. God is still God. No one has dethroned Him. He is still working and doing what He does, comforting, leading, consoling, even bringing good very often from adversity, and pain. So what does the pandemic have to do with Christmas? I think it has quite a bit. There's still a lot of fear in the air today, even with the approval and the distribution of a vaccine. Over at least 100 times in the Bible, either God, an angel, a prophet, the psalmist, or Jesus himself said to someone, don't be afraid. And the answer was consistent with the reason to not fear, God is with us. And this response in the Christmas story is the very heart of what we call the incarnation. God, who has always been, came to the earth in the form of flesh and was named Jesus. Incarnation comes from the Latin word incarnate, meaning to make flesh. God embodied himself in the person of Jesus. And in his retelling of the Christmas story, the gospel writer Matthew shares it in this manner. Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 And 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That word Emmanuel can be spelled either with the beginning letter of I or E. It becomes a title for Jesus in Scripture. We've seen for the last few Sundays and at our Christmas Eve services the titles of Jesus in Messiah. Lord, Savior, Light of the World, and today, Emmanuel, God is with us. So first, I want you to notice that the title Emmanuel gives us the journey of God. The birth of Jesus was a fulfillment of a prediction from 700 years earlier when the prophet Isaiah wrote, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. God's plan was to not be distant from people, rather he wanted to be near us. You know, sometimes you may travel over Christmas. Now, obviously, travel was very limited this year due to the pandemic. But some of you may have traveled somewhere else for Christmas, to a relative's house. Maybe you're watching today from a family member's house instead of your own home. When Mary discovered she was expecting Jesus, she traveled to see her cousin Elizabeth And when the census was required, Mary and Joseph traveled some 90 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. The Magi traveled hundreds of miles from the east to find Jesus. But the longest journey that first Christmas was the one that was made by God from heaven to earth. When the king of kings left heaven, he came with no luggage, no entourage like a presidential motorcade, no clothing. He was wrapped in cloths, placed in a feeding trough for animals. 
I want to remind you of something this morning. God won't just move heaven and earth to keep His promises. He will leave heaven for earth to keep His promises. God promised a birth of Emmanuel into this world. In his book, God Came Near, Max Lucado writes, The omnipotent in one instant made himself breakable. He who had become been spirit became pierceable. He who was larger than the universe became an embryo. And he who sustains the world with a word chose to be dependent upon the nourishment of a young girl. God as a fetus, holiness sleeping in a womb, the creator of life being created. God was given eyebrows, elbows, two kidneys, and a spleen. He stretched against the walls and floated in the amniotic fluids of his mother. God had come near. Now, the idea of Emmanuel, God with us, is always going to be somewhat of a mystery to us. I want to ask God in heaven one day, why did you come into this world as a helpless baby? Why did you not come as a king riding a white horse with sword in hand? God, you may not have caused this pandemic, but why did you allow it to occur? Until two or three days ago, you probably had some packages under your Christmas tree, and most of those gifts were probably a mystery. They were unknown to the recipients that would open them. Now, they were known by someone, the persons who purchased them and who wrapped them. Although I have to admit there have been some Christmases that I've bought Barb gifts and had her wrap them, and then I have forgotten what is in them. I did catch her off guard a little bit this year. The laptop she uses had been having some problems recently. It's already several years old, and I hinted a few weeks ago that she might want to consider getting a new one. But then I did a couple of things to her old laptop, and she said, you know, we really don't need to spend the money for a new one. But about three weeks ago, Barb went down to Cincinnati to see our son, and I didn't go. And the evening she was away, I ordered for her a new laptop. But she wondered what was in that one package under the tree with her name on it. Now, the other packages with her name, she'd already wrapped them for herself. So she knew what was in those. So while she had knowledge of most of her gifts, there still was just a bit of mystery. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7 says, No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. Initially, God's gift to humanity was wrapped in flesh and remained a mystery. The journey of God into this world was packaged inside the body of an infant. Now, I cannot completely understand God becoming flesh and how Jesus could be fully God and fully human. But I believe if an invisible virus can invade our cells and be replicated, that God can invade humanity and become one of us. Emmanuel is about the journey of God. Nikki sang so beautifully, He was not the one we thought would come. We were looking for a king. But he didn't come in glory, the author of the oceans and the sun. Still, he chose to be written in our story so he could fill our flesh and blood and we could know his love. Emmanuel, a manger for a bed, no crown upon his head. He came like us instead. Emmanuel, he meets you where you are. He holds your heavy heart. Our God is with us all. Emmanuel, Emmanuel. So in the title of Emmanuel is the journey of God. And second in the title of Emmanuel is the humanity of Jesus. John chapter 1 verse 14 in the message is paraphrased, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. You know what we like about Christmas are the brilliant versions of the Christmas story. We sing songs about lowing cattle, whatever that might mean. We talk about Mary giving birth in a stable and the little drummer boy boy looks on. And there are shepherds that are beckoned by flying angels and soon Gaspar and Balthasar and Melchior come riding their camels. They have followed the star to the barn to to present their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. It is difficult for us to imagine God taking on human flesh. It is the divine taking on the sometimes undignified. It's the most powerful becoming the most inadequate. It is the one who knew no bounds of flesh to suddenly be trapped within the confines of a physical body. And the notion that God might show up looking human honestly shouldn't be that hard to believe. Plenty of Hollywood films have done a great job developing this idea. Bruce Almighty, 
Evan Almighty have God being portrayed by Morgan Freeman. Oh, God has George Burns playing the part of the divine. When Burns was asked back in 1977 why he was chosen to play the role of God, he responded, because I am the person closest to his age. Now, in that movie, God appears in human form. But God could have chosen to be a man or a woman of any color, any shape. In 2007, the book The Shack was published, and then 10 years later, it was made into a movie. Mac Phillips' daughter, Missy, had been abducted during a family vacation four years earlier, and he finds a note to return to that spot, and he walks back into his darkest nightmare. And he's introduced to a trio of strangers who gradually reveal their identities. There's an African-American woman who is God. There is a Middle Eastern man who is Jesus. There is an Asian woman who is the Holy Spirit. And their purpose is to help Mac understand his life as seen from a higher perspective. But God chose to enter the world, to move into our neighborhood, initially as an infant. He didn't just appear in human form. He took on human form. Often when I do funerals, I'll use the passage in John chapter 11 where Jesus' good friend Lazarus had died following an illness. And it's in that scenario that Jesus talks to Lazarus' two sisters, Mary and Martha, and mentions to both about the death and then the eventual resurrection of their brother. As Jesus realizes the depth of grief they are suffering, he too takes on the same grief. And that's what's always amazed me about that story. The God-man Jesus, who would raise Lazarus from the dead, allowed for these few moments his humanity to be clearly seen. Now, there are two phrases in that story that are evident that Jesus' humanity was real. The first is one of the shortest verses in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. But the second is more profound when it reads, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And the word for trouble is literally, he snorted like a horse. It means Jesus' grief for a time was uncontrollable. But as that story plays out, Jesus moves from his humanness to his being divine, and he raises Lazarus from the dead. God came down among us and walked in our shoes. Daniel Pink is an international best-selling author, and he writes about selling and persuasion in business and how to reshape a person's career and transform businesses. Pink says, if you are going to be a good business person, you need to understand your clients and their perspective before you just start marketing what you want to sell. He writes, empathy is about standing in someone else's shoes, feeling his or her heart, seeing with his or her eyes. Someone imagined Judgment Day and people from all walks of life standing in line waiting to be evaluated by God. Some of them began to mumble, who is God to judge us? He lives here in this perfect, protected environment. He doesn't know what we went through. So they formed a committee and they developed a series of accusations against God. If he were going to judge them fairly, he would experience some of the horrible abuses they knew while on earth. A survivor of the Holocaust said, let him be born to a despised race. A homeless man insisted, let him grow in poverty. A grief-stricken teenager said, let one of his parents die and leave him to weep night after night. A man who grew up in a broken home cried, let the legitimacy of his parents be questioned and then grow up in a single-parent home. A blue-collar worker said, let him have to work with his hands to make a living. A divorcee complained, let him be betrayed by someone he really loves. A prisoner of war bitterly suggested, let him be tortured and taunted by enemies who hate him. A terminally ill patient sneered, let him know he's going to die and then have to struggle for every breath. And one by one, they brought their accusations. And the crowd cheered in agreement after each one. But after they were all read, the audience grew silent because they realized God had already served his sentence. Emmanuel, God is with us, is about the journey of God. And about his becoming human in the form of Jesus. Emmanuel, God is with us, also is the promise for us. What is the benefit for us that Jesus came to this world? 
It is literally in the word Emmanuel and the promise of it, which its very meaning is God with us. God has arrived in our neighborhood. It means that God is interested in our lives. If God is really with us, the implications are endless, and they're not just for Mary and Joseph in the Christmas story, nor are they just for the shepherds who were on a hillside, nor are they just for some wise men who were following a star. God is interested in your life and in my life. God went to great lengths to bridge the gap and for us not to be just some kind of wind-up robots. But here's the greater issue sometimes. We sometimes do not believe God is near because the gift of Jesus can get clouded when life's circumstances knock us to the ground. You have a newly earned degree and no job. You have a great marriage and no child. You're home today alone. Some struggle with their past and they ask, why would God want to be with me after what I've done? Well, the person in the Christmas story who learned first and foremost about Emmanuel, God with us, was Mary. As God's plan began to unfold and an angel visited Mary, she was given a promise in Luke 1.28. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, becoming the mother of God is not an easy task. The jeers, the remarks Mary would hear and experience probably at times, probably left her wondering about God's plan. Maybe that's you today. You have some questions. You have some doubts about your life right now. Will you believe the promise, Emmanuel, God is with you? It is so much easier to see God working in our lives in retrospect than it is the immediate perspective. No matter what you've experienced thus far during this pandemic or what you might experience in the next few months, remember there is nothing that will occur that God has not yet experienced. You may have felt abandoned in life, maybe by a spouse, maybe by your parents, by a sibling, by somebody you thought was a loyal friend. You may have been stung by the pain of racial or ethnic prejudice or the looks of financially arrogant or the words from those who felt they are emotionally superior to you. But here's the promise of Emmanuel. God has not abandoned you. The same God who was with Mary is the same God who promises to be with you and me. Jesus is the first and the best Christmas gift ever. Jesus being Emmanuel is for the person who has everything and for the person who has nothing. Jesus came not just to save us, but to live among us and identify with our struggles in this world. In one act of becoming completely human, Jesus identified with us. On a wall near the main entrance to the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, is a portrait with the following inscription. James Butler Bonham. No picture of him exists. This portrait is of his nephew, Major James Bonham, deceased, who greatly resembled his uncle. It is placed here by the family that people may know the appearance of the man who died for freedom. No literal picture of God exists either. But Jesus is described as the image of the invisible God. Christmas says, here's God. He's arrived on the scene. He's moved into your neighborhood. And from the wood of the manger to the wood of the cross... Jesus Christ lived in this world. Emmanuel, God with us. What a journey he had from heaven to earth and then from the manger to the cross. And yet in those journeys, he never strayed off course from his mission. As we wrap up 2020 and we look forward to what will hopefully be a much better 2021, Will we keep believing the promise, Emmanuel, God with us? I hope for today you had opportunity to get the emblems of communion and to have them at home with you. If you do not have the emblems of communion, certainly you can use things like crackers and juice, something that will help you visually to remember Jesus' body and blood and to remember his death upon the cross. 
Let's pray, and then we'll partake of communion. Father, we thank you that we can see Emmanuel, God with us, in the form of Jesus Christ, that we can identify with you and you can identify with us because of your becoming flesh, because of your taking on the perspective of humanity and your walking this earth like we walk this earth even today. And that there isn't anything that we'll ever experience that you haven't already yet experienced. And may it remind us how much you love us and how much you care for us to become one of us. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you will take the bread that represents Jesus' body. We will partake together. And then the juice that represents Jesus' blood will partake together. If you want to talk about what it means to accept Christ, what it means to be baptized into him, what it means to bring membership to our church, I would invite you to email me at paulsnoddy at trivillage.org. And we'd love to talk to you about your relationship with Jesus Christ and what it means to be a follower of his. I want to thank you for watching online this morning. And I want to mention just a couple of things. One of them is for the end-of-the-year offerings, you can mail those to the church as long as they're postmarked by December the 31st of this year. They can be counted towards your contributions for this year for tax purposes. You can also drop off your offerings at the church office through December the 30th. But probably the safest way is you can give online. I want to remind you there is a two-day turnaround, so that you would need to give by Tuesday at the latest so that it would make it through for make your gift for the end of the year. Next Sunday at church, I will announce the total of our Christmas Eve offering and where we stand in eliminating the, our second mortgage with the Hunt Fund. Now, again, it is our plan to have next Sunday our schedule of three worship services on site at 8.30, 9.50 and 11.10, and remind you that the 9.50 and 11.10 will also be offered online. So as 2020 begins to draw to a close, thank you to each one who has participated with us this year. Some of you have been able to participate with us in, in person in worship services. Some of you, because of various situations, have had to participate online so you can be kept safe from the virus, and we appreciate your faithfulness as well. As we look forward to what 2021 will bring, we're hopeful that the pandemic will come to an end and that we can soon gather in larger worship settings and we can lift up the name of Jesus Christ together and being reminded that even during a pandemic, Emmanuel, God, is with us. Thank you for joining us.